Welcome to my conversation today about uh, cold hardy berry varieties that work well in northern climates. Uh, and I'm going to talk a lot about Montana today, of course, because that's where I am. I'll introduce kind of Montana and uh, uh, the environment and some of the reasons about why we chose some of the, the species and cultivars that we're working with uh, and some of the things that we're learning about them uh, as part of that talk. So uh, I know that we're scattered around all over the place uh, and we'll see some information that uh, might not be directly applicable to your ecosystem and to your region, but uh, there'll be a lot of crossovers I'm willing to bet. Uh, and I hope I get you kind of excited about some of these species and varieties of berries. Uh, quick little agenda for our talk today. Uh, set the scene about uh, some of the berries that we're working with, why we made some of those choices and how we started down this investigation path. Uh, I'll introduce several different species that we're doing some research trials on and some investigations on uh, and how we're promoting them here in Montana as a potential high value crop for small scale berry orchardists and backyard gardeners. Uh, with each of those species and cultivars. We'll talk a little bit about some of the pests and some of the disease or uh, challenges that we've seen uh, in growing those uh, and then some management strategies. Uh, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about kind of the preventative side of planting out a berry orchard in uh, uh, thinking about how to develop that orchard and putting in place uh, some of the, the key structures before you even begin to plant out so that you can start you off successfully the first way. Uh, and then at the end, yeah, I just want to get you excited about berry crops. Been working with these for a couple of years, get more and more excited about it uh, every time I work with them. And I, I, bit the bullet last year and bought a whole bunch of plants and started planting out of my own place because uh, I'm that excited about it uh, and that uh, engaged in the possibilities in the future. First off, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, it, kind of uh, regionally where we're at, why we started making some of the decisions that we did, uh, and some of the things that we wrestle with in our Montana climate. The first things first, um, Montana uh, can be kind of a cold place. So uh, here's a map of the USDA uh, plant hardiness zones and definitely with, um, uh, with the place. So I'm in Missoula uh, and based here in the Western part of the state. And we're kind of a series of mountain valleys, uh, some, some nice gorgeous mountains and then a lot of great valleys that have rivers flowing through the middle of them. And uh, for Missoula uh, and the Bitterroot Valley just to the south of us and then to the uh, uh, the valley just north of us there where the Clark Fork River heads on out, uh, we're considered the banana belt of uh, Montana. We're warmer uh, and have a more forgiving climate than a lot of the other parts of our state. Uh, the USDA, uh, the, the hardiness map classifies Missoula, my area, uh, as a 5A um, which uh, when we talk to most nurserymen and most orchardists and a lot of people around here, they say, oh, that's pretty optimistic. Uh, and we definitely get ourselves down uh, every year. We'll get ourselves pretty darn cold. So, uh, you know, down to 20, uh, negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, not abnormal for us in the winter uh, or in, within an occurrence of that every couple of winters. If you go east of the Rocky Mountain front and you start heading east across uh, our state, we start getting much colder. So a uh, haver is up there in that northern central part of our state. They're definitely classified as a 3A. It just gets pretty cold there all the time. Uh, and uh, the last reference there is um, Big Timber, which is somewhere down here along the bottom of our state, uh, kind of near Yellowstone National Park. And uh, one of the great conversations that we have with some of the growers and the extension agents down there in that region is, you know, yeah, you know, it's, we're not extremely cold, but you know what we have is we have a 60 mile an hour wind that seems to blow every single day of the year. So uh, um, when we talk to them about apple trees or other orchards, they say, ah, that's not as practical for us uh, because uh, those, uh, those trees are not going to withstand that kind of wind uh, or going to have a really hard time withstanding that wind. So uh, definitely our cold climate uh, influenced some of the berry choices that we started to research on. We wanted things that were really cold hardy so that we could test them out and have them be something that could be a consideration all across the state of Montana, including those zone three parts of our state. So here a little bit more of an unpacking kind of our regional climates. Uh, this is a great graph. I really love this one. I talk to gardeners about this all the time. This is set, uh, kind of centered around that, that Western Montana, the Missoula Valley and the central Bitterroot. Uh, we have our last frost of the spring 
typically sometime in late May. So it could be, uh, you know, this graph is telling us that we have about a 50-50 chance that it has occurred by May 22nd. And then it continues on where 50% chance that we have another one coming after that time. Uh, the last couple of years has been right around June 10th has been our last frost. So that can influence some of our choices about planting out. Uh, and for some of those more frost tender uh, berries and plants. Uh, if we catch them with a hard frost while they're in blossom, that can uh, uh, damage some buds, damage some fruit and flowers. So uh, something for us to consider. We gives us, uh, if we have our first frost of the year, sometime in early to mid-September, gives us right around 120 frost-free growing days. So uh, some of the berries that we're going to talk about can start blooming fairly early in the year and are fairly cold tolerant. So they really will survive a frost throughout that blossom period or through that fruit set. Uh, and then they'll finish up pretty quickly so that we're not trying to push them to get done before that first frost in the fall. Uh, so we have about 120 frost-free growing days in the uh, Missoula and Bitterroot Valleys. And then for our total heat accumulation throughout the year or growing degree units, if you're familiar with that term, uh, we have about 2,100 on average, about a 10 year average of that. Uh, in that mountain environment, um, it, it, that can be more erratic from year to year. So uh, some species really love more heat units than that. Most of the berries that we're working with want fewer degree growing days than that in order to accumulate uh, enough heat units to, to finish and ripen that crop. In addition to our cold, we're also a pretty arid region. So uh, we have uh, uh, about 13 inches of rain equivalency as precipitation uh, per, an average per uh, year to year. Uh, and that's really concentrated a lot in the winter and the spring. Uh, right around June, we have the, the spring rains kind of shut off and we get ourselves into July and we go July, August and September with a, a, a long, hot, dry summer. Uh, so we get pretty arid and you know, 13 inches isn't a whole lot more than what can be classified as a desert environment. So we, uh, Montana has a large uh, section of the state where we just don't get a lot of precipitation and we're a pretty arid environment. So uh, definitely that's to our benefit in a lot of these systems uh, because we can provide supplemental irrigation through drip or through some uh, uh, irrigation systems onto these berries and onto these crops. Uh, and if we keep that irrigation off the leaves and off the foliage of the plants, then that really arid dry air can really help us mitigate and control a lot of pests and pathogens and fungal things that might show up on leaves uh, and affect the, both the plant and the, the fruit that uh, other states have to wrestle with when they have a more uh, humid climate uh, and get a lot more precipitation. So that's really a, a nice benefit to uh, doing things in Montana is that uh, we have this super uh, dry, arid air that uh, really keeps uh, some of the things that other people in other places have to wrestle with uh, to a real minimal amount or non-existent for us. Montana is becoming a more and more popular place over time. That's a story that uh, a lot of different places in the West are telling. So this is a, a quick little map to show uh, some of our high value agricultural soils or agricultural farmlands that are experiencing high development pressures typically associated with uh, uh, the more urban areas of Montana. So uh, if it's colored red, then it's a, a prime agricultural land that's also got really high speculative, speculative value for development uh, or for subdivisions or for creating big farms into smaller farms and smaller uh, uh, chunks of land. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the association and particularly in those uh, uh, mountain valleys of good floodplains and good soils and good access to irrigation water. So one of the strategies that we were looking for in considering some of these berries is that uh, with this development uh, pressure of land that we're really struggling to find viable agricultural opportunities that can uh, allow for farmers to enter the market, pay uh, the, the price or pay the rental price for small properties of land uh, that are under such high development pressure and under such high valuation because of that development pressure. Uh, so can we find opportunities for really high value per acre crops 
that uh, can create a sustainable farming business uh, and allow a farmer to, to get in uh, to have a real high density, high value crop uh, that makes a viable farm operation on smaller acreage to uh, fit into these places and create kind of a local or regional food economy that uh, can participate at that local scale. And hand on hand of that is uh, when we put in kind of this high density, high value crop uh, so that we uh, typically a lot of those have a higher uh, need for labor and uh, intensive management and harvest particularly. And we have some challenges with uh, a labor force here in Montana, particularly we, we just don't have that agricultural uh, labor force that comes in and helps with harvest and helps with management the way that some other states and agricultural economies do. So uh, this is a picture here on the right hand side of a, a really fancy PTO driven uh, drive behind a tractor uh, automatic berry harvester. Uh, so some of the decisions we made about the species that we were going to look at was also the applicability and possibilities of using mechanical harvest as a way to save uh, labor uh, and the, the costs associated with um, ha uh, having a, and finding a large labor force to be able to pay uh, to, to do some hand harvesting or some delicate harvesting of these berries. So uh, we're looking a little bit at that, uh, how mechanical harvesters like these are some of the more simple ones that you'll see coming up, uh, how those uh, treat the fruit and some of the options of market channels based on how we can use that but uh, again, kind of thinking how can small farmers on small plots of land uh, have a high value crop that uh, they can really manage with fewer people uh, to make a good agricultural business instead of having a large labor force to draw upon. Uh, one of the other important things that uh, we were considering about in uh, our Montana setting the scene is that uh, we have a lot of calcium in most of our soils in Montana. So we have pretty high pH soils and I think I can cue it up here, there we go, where we have, uh, um, so calcium will bump a soil into a slightly alkaline soil or a, a little bit more basic than a, a good neutral soil. So uh, some plants thrive with that, some plants really like that. Uh, one of our favorite berries, blueberries, do not thrive with that and in fact don't like alkaline soils at all. Blueberries really want a slightly acidic soil or a fairly acidic soil down to a pH of five or even a little less. Uh, so we have some places in the state of Montana where uh, if we have a lot of uh, granitic sandstone or, or uh, granitic sandy soils that have uh, formed out of that residuum or a place where we've had a lot of pine needle acidification over time, uh, some of those soils can be pretty acidic. Uh, through their profile, but uh, we wrestle a lot with alkaline soils throughout a lot of the states. Uh, so we can torture some blueberries in those uh, alkaline soils for a couple of years. They just won't thrive. They'll really struggle and even die most likely. So uh, uh, we were considering things that were also going to work with our soils, realizing that uh, blueberries don't have much of a happy place in Montana in so many of our soils. So uh, kind of thinking about that, you know, so uh, why not blueberries? Uh, this is the only time I'm going to spend a whole lot of time talking about blueberries. Uh, you know, it can be fun to experiment, definitely. I love some good blueberries too, but uh, it's that soil pH that really uh, hurts us quite a bit with uh, blueberries as a potential crop. They just want a fairly acidic soil, a pH of five or a little bit less. Uh, huckleberries uh, are a native crop that uh, uh, grow up in the mountains here in Western Montana and they just resist domestication uh, and uh, cultivation um, it, it, like unlike any other plant that uh, we can ever imagine as a berry plant. So there's very little success in getting uh, cultivated varieties of huckleberries uh, to really thrive and survive. So uh, uh, blueberries aren't gonna work in our soils there are some possibilities that uh, if you really needed a couple of blueberries in your backyards, there's a couple of ways that you can kind of tinker with that. Might consider doing some container plantings. Uh, there are a couple of cultivars that are available that uh, are kind of compact and uh, can even be marketed as like, hey, pretty good for a, a container. Um, you know, would be a possibility to do some heavy uh, uh, amendments to soils to try to pull down 
uh, that pH a little bit. So I'd always suggest a, a, a soil test to kind of know where you're starting. Um, but it's, they're really not that practical of amendments, uh, particularly if you're wrestling with a slightly higher pH and an alkaline soil. It might take so much of some of those amendments that uh, you trade the, the challenges of that pH uh, into challenges with having toxic amounts of other things that you've put into that soil amendments like sulfur to try to bring that uh, pH down. So uh, blueberries, not particularly practical for a lot of our soils in Montana. Uh, a, a pH test as part of a soil test are going to really tell us where we're starting at. That might inform us, uh, but part of this talk is going to be about making sure we have the right plant at the right place. Uh, and if our soil says that uh, we have a, a more alkaline condition, then uh, um, really part of what that's telling us is that blueberries are not the right plant for that place. With all that information that we talked about setting the scene here in Montana, uh, the, some of the research farms throughout the, the Montana State University, uh, Montana Agriculture Experiment Station, uh, developed a, a, a cross-disciplinary team to do some investigation into cold hardy berries that will work in Montana uh, as, part, as part of a, a super fruits trial or a superfoods trial, very similar to blueberries in that they have high antioxidants. Uh, so the, the Montana Agriculture Experiment Station, WARC stands for Western Agriculture Research Center. It's based in Corvallis, Montana. Uh, they really led the charge with this team that included the Flathead Community College, uh, MSU Bo uh, Bozeman Plant Science Faculty, uh, and the Montana State University Extension to uh, begin a cultivar trial and some investigation into different types and varieties of berries that would work here that could be a potential crop. So uh, that started in 2015. We'll take a look at some information and things that they've learned over the last five years, uh, which has really helped us uh, think about and envision what a, a small berry industry here in Montana is shaping up to be. Some of the questions that they looked at when they were doing uh, forming this research project and they've been continuing to evaluate over those last five years have been to determine which species and cultivars survive well and do well here in Western Montana and produce well. Uh, we also have an effort and uh, emphasis in educating growers and, uh, and consumers about fruits, uh, sometimes bringing new types of berries that uh, don't have a lot of consumer awareness onto the market and doing some education about them as a possibility for consumers to, uh, to enjoy. Um, to increase both the supply and demand of local grown fruit for use in processing, for use as sales in fresh markets, uh, and in increasing that awareness that uh, Montana can be a place where we grow fresh fruit as well. Uh, so doing some research about the winter hardiness, uh, learning a little bit about the types of pests uh, and diseases that might bother some of these crops, uh, learning a little bit about their production potential, uh, and even going into some investigation about different flavor profiles uh, and starting to now just on the early ends of looking at some possible product development for value-added processing with some of these berries, which uh, is a pretty fun and interesting uh, uh, pathway that uh, some researchers are going down. So all of these berries that we're gonna talk about here uh, in the next part of the session, are uh, um, high antioxidant, uh, uh, they have a high uh, uh, amount of antioxidants in them uh, for which are known to be kind of those super foods or super healthy foods. So very similar to blueberries. And a lot of these berries have even more antioxidant compounds than blueberries do. So uh, these can be kind of super, super foods compared to blueberries, which are just one of the super foods. So without that, uh, I, I wanna introduce some of these berries, talk about them a little bit more and uh, dive into some of the species and the cultivars that we've been working with uh, because they're really exciting and they're a lot of fun to, to be able to experiment with. Uh, so first one uh, that I wanna talk about is a, called Hascap or it's also called uh, honeyberry is another name for it. It's a, an edible member of the hockey, uh, ho honeysuckle family, excuse me, uh, edible member of the honeysuckle family. And it's native to different kind of northern boreal climates around uh, uh, the northern hemisphere. So it's uh, native to Siberia and Japan, also northern Canada, uh, as well as uh, some of our mountain regions of Montana. So there are some of these native hascaps around. 
uh, there have been uh, a lot of breeding programs to do some selective uh, choices about traits and particularly the size of fruit and the taste of fruit uh, to create some commercially viable uh, you know, options and cultivars of these plants. Uh, some of them taste like they're really high in antioxidant content uh, and they taste like it. They taste like turpentine or something that's pretty crazy. Uh, so there's been a lot of work to uh, choose cultivars, varieties, and do some uh, selective crossbreeding to create a fruit that's really palatable, that's really enjoyable, uh, and uh, also has that high antioxidant content. Uh, Hascaps are extremely cold hardy uh, to zone two. So they, uh, um, are uh, this very, very cold hardy plant. Maybe a little too cold hardy in that they start blooming really early in the spring, uh, even before uh, with some of these false springs that we're having, they'll start blooming right away. I have a couple of different varieties of has caps myself. Uh, my earliest ones are blooming uh, or, or just ready to crack bud. Uh, some of my later ones are not quite there yet, but uh, they they bloom pretty early. So uh, uh, they er they also, ripen fairly early in the year, as early as mid-June. Uh, and we have a couple different bloom cycles that we'll talk about. As these plants mature, they get about four feet tall, about four feet wide. Uh, and they'll come into kind of full fruit production in about five or six years. So they will need a suitable cross-pollinizer in order to produce fruit. Uh, so there's some different cultivars that we pair up together in order to achieve that. Uh, and there's typically an early, a mid, and a late season blooming cycle. So we want to make sure that we have two pollinizers in the same bloom cycle to get maximum pollination for those. Uh, they produce, uh, I say here, they have a grape-sized kind of blueberry meets a raspberry. We're struggling with how to define what the flavor profile and what the berry is for this, but uh, uh, blueberry meets a raspberry might be kind of nice. Like it's a good blueberry meat, uh, kind of has a little bit of a zing to it, uh, has a little bit of a bite, but it's a really tasty bite. Um, you know, maybe a small size grape too. When I say grape, think more wine grape instead of a big fat table grape. Uh, each bush can produce up to 10 pounds of berries per mature bush. And some of the cultivars are producing even more than that, up to 13 pounds. So uh, for one bush that's four feet tall, that's quite a bit of fruit that uh, has a possibility uh, to be produced. Um, typically tend to be uh, a really easy plant to care for. Doesn't need a lot of pruning. Uh, we're doing some experimenting with um, kind of rejuvenation pruning and learning some things about that, but uh, they don't need a lot of hands-on touching. They really do manage themselves pretty well. Uh, there's a lot of different cultivars that we're experimenting with these, and uh, uh, they have a whole different set of flavor profiles and sugar diversity uh, and kind of shape and uh, palatability of the berry for that fresh market. Uh, a lot of different possible uses for these, which we'll talk about here at the end, but uh, uh, different cultivars definitely have different uh, profiles uh, and, and some different interests for different things. There's a, a, not a whole lot of disease or insect issues that we've observed in five years in the trials. Uh, really nothing has really popped up. Uh, and they have a lot of different similar uses. So there can be a fresh, possible fresh market, definitely a, a processed uh, market for jams, jellies, other things. Really, uh, uh, really great potential for fruit wines or for a juicing market, and then maybe even some additional applications as a, a frozen product that can be integrated into other things. So it's a pretty widespread uh, potential uh, opportunities for this crop um, that really can uh, find several different market channels, which is really exciting for potential berry growers. Uh, the University of Saskatchewan and Oregon State University have really taken the lead on developing uh, commercial cultivars of this uh, uh, these hascaps and uh, um, so there's a, a lot of different varieties that are coming out uh, and they have uh, some named varieties both from Saskatchewan and Oregon State University. Uh, and then our researchers definitely wanted to make sure that anybody who's considering has caps or honeyberries as a possible crop uh, for me to make sure that I tell you that uh, uh, these berries will start purpling up kind of early in that season, a couple weeks before they're ready for harvest. But even as they start to purple, they're not finished ripening 
uh, yet. It takes at least two more weeks after they start changing color for that berry to finish ripening. Uh, if you run out there as soon as you see that berry turn purple and you pull it off and you pop it in your mouth, you're going to think that we uh, chose the worst crop ever to talk about because it can still be kind of bitter, a little bit astringent, uh, and it's just not done ripening yet, even though the exterior of the berry looks like it's done ripening. So uh, definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, definitely let that stay on the plant and finish ripening and uh, uh, try it. You can even split open the berries a little bit and look for that purple color on the inside all the way through the berry as a sign that uh, it's finishing that ripening process. Different cultivars have different practices. Uh, so we're, what part of what we're learning is that some of the cultivars and some of the established uh, ones that they're establishing for commercial production, uh, those berries will ripen more altogether on the plant at the same time. Uh, for some cultivars, they're a little more differentiated and they're ripening at different times. Some cultivars are better able to hold on to that fruit onto the bush as it's ripening. Others will start shedding that fruit a little more freely as it starts to ripen. Uh, so with these plants, uh, no real significant pest or disease that we've really seen. Uh, some of the real challenges that we've seen are that uh, they can break dormancy really early. And if we get hit with a really hard frost as they're breaking dormancy, we can see a little bit of bud damage, but uh, really they, uh, um, they're pretty resilient plants uh, and they, they get going pretty early in the season. So uh, uh, birds really are the pests that we have to manage with uh, for a lot of berry crops, including this crop, because we'd be Birds can lead to a complete crop loss uh, if they're allowed to just move in and strip those plants as those berries ripen. So some kind of bird exclosure is really the way that uh, we're finding a lot of ways to go with this. So here's an example of a, a, a simplified little bird netting that's held up over that, uh, uh, those, those uh, different shrubs there that are, uh, the, the researchers were trying to protect us, these couple of bushes to do some measurement on those different cultivars, keeping the birds out so that they can do the full measurement of it and collect all the fruit. Uh, you know, sure looks like it's keeping that guy out of that, uh, off those berry plants pretty well. So some kind of bird exclusion, pretty important for it. Uh, there's some research going on with the use of lasers in some of these orchards. So we don't have to invest in the netting or the exclosure system to keep birds completely out of the orchard that uh, possibly some kind of a laser deterrent would work. There's some research kind of starting up on that. Uh, so we'll see where that takes us here in a couple of years about the viability of that as a possible tool. So I'm gonna kind of switch uh, now into a different, uh, different species. So a dwarf sour cherry, um, also known as a bush cherry. So these are uh, um, a stone fruit, so uh, a, a pruned species, so a little bit different than uh, you know, a true uh, berry, but something that's in the trials in part because uh, they're extremely cold hardy again, the zone two. So it's a possibility to get cherries into a lot of places in the state of Montana where we would not be able to otherwise get cherries. Uh, they are a sour cherry or a pie cherry. Uh, these are more shrub form or bush form. So they'll have typically kind of multi-stem trunks, uh, eight to 12 feet high uh, as they get towards maturity. Uh, and they'll ripen that late July, early August period of time. So uh, as a, an opportunity to bring cherries into large parts of the state, these uh, seem like they're really good plant opportunities. Uh, University of Saskatchewan has really been doing a lot of development of uh, some of the, the commercial cultivars that are on the market. They have some great names like uh, Romeo and Juliet, R2, uh, Carmen Jewel is out there, uh, and Crimson Passion. Those are uh, all cultivars that you can find on the USA market, uh, some of them more than others. Uh, with our, uh, our research trials, the Crimson Passion did not seem to to, to pan out very well for Montana. It hasn't produced uh, nearly any fruit over the last several years. So uh, while well, Romeo and Juliet and Carmen Jewel really took off the Crimson Passion uh, and a couple other cultivars that we looked at just haven't uh, um, quite done the same thing. But uh, that's part of why we do some of these cultivar trials. Uh, and by the end of the presentation, I'll show you where you can find some information uh, on how these different cultivars are behaving. Some of them uh, have get to pretty high sugar content when they're fully ripe uh, and, and can really be enjoyed as a fresh eating cherry. So uh, that's kind of exciting that uh, uh, even though they're classified as a sour cherry, uh, yeah, I mean, you really can't pull it off the plant and pop it in your mouth without uh, additional sugar uh, and enjoy it if you're uh, really targeting that 
that fresh eating market or the possibility of that fresh eating market. Uh, here in Western Montana, we have a small place in our state in association with Flathead Lake where we can grow sweet cherries and get that lake effect temperature that allows us to just eke out a super small microclimate for uh, uh, fresh sweet cherries. Uh, and they really dominate part of our state every summer um, with the, that market as it, uh, they start harvesting and marketing them fresh. But uh, for other parts of our state, this is really a possibility to get fresh cherries out there quickly uh, and uh, use them both as a possibility of a fresh eating product as well as a processed product. They come into production a little bit slower. Uh, you know, they start production after a couple of years and then they really continue to ramp up. And uh, we'll see kind of where they hit that plateau of mature production uh, as they continue to get older in the, the trials that we have operating. A couple of pests for us to, uh, to manage with cherries. Uh, the, the cherry fruit fly is a, a challenge. And in Eastern Montana, we've seen occurrences of spotted winged Drosophila. Uh, they both kind of behave the same way. The, the, the winged adults emerge somewhere throughout the uh, late spring or midsummer. Uh, and so we start controlling for those winged adults. They'll lay eggs in and around the plant uh, near the fruit and those eggs will hatch into larvae, which will go burrow into uh, the fruit and can ruin the fruit uh, if it's uh, targeted for um, that fresh eating market or that process market. So uh, definitely uh, if trying to grow this crop, we definitely have to have a, a control management strategy for uh, management of these pests to, to keep the larvae from infecting the, flute, uh, the fruit. So it includes a, a pesticide spray regime that uh, when we monitor for the adults, we uh, employ that spray regime. We carry it through from the presence of the winged adults through the end of the summer and through harvest to make sure that we've kept the larvae out of those fruits and that we've kept those fruit intact. Uh, there's also a, a possible cultural option that one of our orchards is using where uh, they're harvesting specifically for juice. So uh, they will harvest, uh, do an early harvest of their cherries before uh, the emergence of the, uh, the winged adults. And so they'll pull that fruit off. It's not ripe yet, but they're using it as a juicing product. So uh, um, they really uh, take that, they get that cherry fruit essence out of it, even though it's not quite ripe and they use it for their product. Uh, and that's the way that they're treating uh, and managing for that uh, spotted winged Drosophila uh, in that case. A um, couple other things that uh, can, can affect these trees or these shrubs as well. Uh, aphids definitely, but uh, you can take no action with aphids and allow those natural predators that are gonna move into that population to do a lot of control. Uh, or there's a couple of simple topical treatments like neem oil or horticultural oil that can work as well. Uh, Deer and birds, the big pests that we face with these as well, uh, in addition to that cherry fruit fly. So fencing out deers, uh, deer and netting out birds, uh, one of those really important things that we need to do in order to protect uh, our plants. Uh, and I can attest to this in person. I have a couple of dwarf sour cherries in my orchard with a bunch of apples. Uh, and I had some deer get into uh, my orchard over the winter and uh, they went specifically to those dwarf sour cherries and mowed them down uh, and ignored the apples to go to the cherry. So it was definitely some kind of preferred forage for them was to go nip those sour cherry plants down. So uh, protect them against deer, net them seasonally for birds to, uh, to keep that crop intact. There we go. So uh, next berry crop we'll talk about elderberries. Uh, and there's a couple of different species that uh, we can see represented. So they're all from the Sambucus genus. Uh, Sambucus nigra is our European cultivars. Uh, and then Canadensis and Cerulea uh, are North American cultivars. So uh, a lot of the development for commercial purposes are coming out of those European cultivars. Uh, they have really high antioxidant content and they have a lot of different health benefits. And in some places, uh, particularly Europe, uh, there's been a lot of interest for a lot of years and there's been a lot of uh, engagement in those health benefits of elderberries. So if you've seen elderberry extracts during cold and flu season or elderberry wine, uh, definitely as a strong European following that's making its way here. Uh, the University of Missouri and Missouri State have really led the development and work in the United States uh, for some commercial cultivars as well as uh, Nova Scotia has been doing some work as well. Uh, and there's some, some really long 
uh, long-term practices with some of the native species here in cer certain parts of our country. Uh, I know California is doing a lot of work with the Sambuca cerulea, uh, which is native down in their part uh, and doing some work around hedges uh, and increasing the diversity of agricultural opportunities on some of their uh, farms and plots of land uh, with, with that, uh, those species. So uh, elderberries, they're, they're cold hardy to zone four. Um, they can do a little better if you have a, a cross pollinizer. Uh, they get pretty tall and they're, they're a pretty rapidly growing plant. They can get up to 20 feet tall uh, and they uh, are great for that elderberry wine if you've ever run across that or as a liquid supplement to add to different things. Um, good, big warning here that uh, the raw berry is not for raw consumption. It has some toxicity uh, that it carries. So we have to process it somehow to denature that uh, toxicity in the raw berry. So uh, not, for, not for just raw consumption. We have to process it somehow. Uh, doesn't face a whole lot of pest challenges, aphids. Uh, some cultivars are a little more cold hardy than others. Uh, and then the other challenge with this is that um, there's different, different cultivars, different varieties. Uh, some are determinate and then some are indeterminate uh, and the fruit don't ripen evenly. So as a crop, uh, you're continually having to go back through and do multiple harvests of the berries on these uh, as uh, those, those fruit come ripe. So uh, a little bit different than uh, some of the other berry species in that you might have to take several trips through your orchard with elderberries to, to do harvest of the berries as they become ripe. Switch a little more gears here and we'll talk about currants, uh, the ribes uh, genus, and there's a both black and red currants that are coming on as commercial species. There are native current species throughout Montana and throughout the West. Uh, and even gooseberries, if you're familiar with those, are also genus ribes. Uh, but the, the red and black currants that we're talking about are European cultivars that have been developed for commercial production uh, and have uh, come into the US for uh, and uh, North America for uh, berry commercial production. Uh, there's a real history of eradication of currants in <clears throat> The, the Western US and Canada uh, historically because it carries a, a, a blister rust, the white pine blister rust. It's the alternative host for that disease, which attacks white pines, which were a very commercially important timber species. So uh, there was a, a long history on uh, uh, forested lands of trying to eradicate currants uh, and even blocking uh, the sale of currants uh, as plants because we were trying to get rid of the white pine blister rust. Uh, they realized through additional science that there's a whole number of alternative hosts for that blister rust, not just currants. Uh, and these uh, European varieties that we're working with for commercial cultivars are resistant to that uh, uh, white pine blister rust. So uh, really have entered the market uh, and having some great show of uh, potential for a, a berry crop. So for uh, red and black currants, um, they get about three to five feet tall at maturity, uh, pretty cold hardy, uh, and they'll tolerate some shade, which is kind of a nice uh, aspect for them. Uh, they ripen around the fourth week of July. Uh, and as part of, uh, as we're listening to some of the different times at which these berry species ripen up, uh, it, it's a really nice aspect of thinking about a mixed species berry plot of how these berries are timed to ripen throughout different times of the growing season, different times of the year. It allows us to spread out that harvest uh, labor effort to uh, uh, if what we do is plant several different species or several different varieties of berries so that we can kind of spread out our workload and not have to harvest uh, a whole big plot of berries all at the same time within the same week. If what we can do is harvest a small chunk for the early part of the season, a small chunk for the mid, and then the late, and then the very late parts of the season. So a really nice possibility to create uh, multiple different kinds of uh, uh, products and to space out our labor and our time. They face some problems that we definitely need to uh, do some work uh, managing through. Uh, current fruit fly can affect uh, the berry in the plants uh, and 
primarily uh, sanitation under the plants to disrupt that life cycle and remove those larvae can do a lot to help kind of disrupt that life cycle. And then also if we're facing this as a pest, we would monitor for the winged adult uh, and use some uh, insecticides that were on label to target those winged adults to bring that population under control if we uh, started facing that as a pest in our current orchard. Uh, current cane borer is going to um, be something that would most likely move into a, 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 a current orchard. Um, so prescribed methane is, is just to, uh, much like uh, other cane borers, uh, we can identify fairly easily uh, an, infected, um, an, an infected cane. There's a picture of it here in the upper top with uh, the larvae inside the cane there uh, does some damage to the vascular tissue and the top part of that cane starts to die. So pruning out that infected cane is the uh, uh, kind of the prescribed method to deal with that. And uh, current saw fly, or is also known as imported current worm, is a, another pest that we see uh, some damage with. And there's a picture there on the bottom of what that kind of looks like, it's just a foliar feeder. So uh, it's a really foliar damage uh, so we can take no action, we can leave it, uh, or there is a possibility to do some hand removal uh, or some on-label insecticide treatment uh, or even some insecticidal soap to kind of affect their, the, those soft body organisms. So, Saskatoons or service berries, uh, another berry that has some great representation as a, a native species in Montana and much of North America. Uh, so we call them service berries here. So Saskatoons are uh, the, the commercially uh, developed cultivars uh, of service berries. Uh, so they're native to, to North America. They're extremely cold hardy and get pretty tall, definitely. Uh, and those Saskatoons mostly developed from the University of Sask uh, Saskatchewan um, as a, a potential crop. And if you ever had a service berry uh, from the, the wild like I have, uh, and you think, my gosh, this is a uh, not very flavorful. Uh, then a Saskatoon is different because it was more of a cultivar, uh, commercially developed cultivar that has better flavor, a little bigger berry, smaller seed. So lots of great things to uh, um, celebrate about Saskatoons that uh, we might not think of as a, a native service, service berry, which uh, you know tastes a little bit more like sawdust sometimes. So uh, uh, definitely some good cultivar work with those. Uh, they definitely face some uh, diseases and pests as a, a widespread uh, native species. Uh, the, all of the, the native pests are also here, ready to go with those. So uh, just a quick review of some of those. Um, cedar apple rust is uh, uh, something that can pop up with them as a, a rose species plant. Uh, it's primarily cosmetic, so we really don't need to take a lot of action with it. It really just affects the leaves and some of the fruit, but uh, usually not enough for us to get super concerned about. Uh, we could consider, uh, so uh, cedars or junipers are an alternative host for that cedar apple rust. That's the early season host. So if we're really facing that as a pest, we could look around for and remove some of those alternative hosts. Uh, and there are some antifungal treatments if it's a really severe infestation, but typically we don't get it that bad here to worry about treating it. Uh, fire blight is another one that can affect this bush. Um, we don't see it a whole lot. Uh, seems like it's kind of um, beyond the, the flower season by the time fire blight gets up and active because it flowers and blossoms pretty early. Uh, if you see it, uh, I've seen it once in uh, the last several years uh, in some plants, uh, but pruning it out aggressively uh, is the standard treatment for fire blight. And uh, if you have a, a high fertility, if it particularly a, a high nitrogen fertility program, uh, reducing that can uh, help with the management of fire blight if you're facing that uh, uh, in a couple of year cycle. Saskatoon sawfly is really the major pest that uh, we face with this berry, uh, and it can be a pretty major pest. It can uh, lead to 50% or more loss of crop uh, if left, left untreated. So definitely if Saskatoons are your berry, uh, going to have to take on a, a treatment plan in order to uh, manage for and control this pest so they don't destroy the fruit. Uh, there's some sanitation things we can do, but then we also have uh, a monitoring system for the winged adult and a, a very uh, kind of controlled and implemented spray regime for control of the winged adult to protect against uh, damage of the fruit by larvae uh, with that pest. So uh, if you're growing Saskatoons, definitely reach out to your local extension or pest professional uh, and get some of the, the timing and the tools that we can use to manage that pest. A couple other things like aphids, not really something we need to worry about. 
And uh, next berry, Aronia, uh, Aronia melo, melanocarpa, uh, also known as chokeberry. Uh, so it's a native to the Eastern USA. Uh, and there's, um, <clears throat> and, and other parts of the planet, uh, there's uh, ornamental cultivars of Aronia, and then there's commercially developed cultivars for berry production uh, that have been hybridized with European mountain ash. Uh, and that's kind of work that typically came out of Russia, I think. So um, definitely if you're interested in growing Aronia, uh, then make sure you get the cultivars that are commercially developed for berry production. Bigger berries, more of them, uh, not an ornamental plant. So they're cold tolerant uh, uh, or cold hardy down to zone three. They're great. They ripen a little bit later in the season, which is great for that uh, late season harvest. Uh, and they get to be you know, a nice shrub, five or six feet tall. And they are loaded with antioxidants. You know, three times the amount as blueberries. They taste like it. Uh, so when I say they're not the best for fresh eating. What I mean is you pop one into your mouth and your lips pucker and your eyes start watering. Uh, they're not tasty uh, for fresh eating, but uh, um, they have uh, just that super high amount of antioxidants. So in a process or juice or in an extract form, uh, some people will use those as some kind of a health benefit. Uh, and there's a real interest in this berry as well. It has that super dark purple blue color uh, for use as a natural dye uh, in food products to get away from you know red dye number three or number five and yellow dye number two uh, to uh, have a natural dye product that uh, we can extract out of these berries and use them as a great natural dye. So uh, I'm kind of done talking about all the berries specifically, but uh, threw this in here just so we could think about a little bit for uh, planning about your future endeavor with uh, a berry or a market. Um, uh, some berries like Hascaps are, have several different market channels uh, where you can do both fresh eating or frozen and processed or juice and wine. There's a lot of different parts of it. Uh, other berries like Aronia, which definitely don't have a fresh eating market, but uh, they have that definite extract or juice or wine possibility and then that natural fruit dye uh, so it might be some really good opportunities to engage in some of those. So uh, uh, with each of those possibilities come the need for uh, thinking about how to handle the fruit, uh, how to harvest the fruit, and how to manage it for that potential market uh, channel. So if we think about has caps that uh, uh, we might be able to mechanically harvest has caps off the bush if we're going to go for that frozen market or for that wine juice market. Uh, we can mechanically harvest those, we can quickly clean them off and then freeze them and then sell them to that processor. Uh, but if we're going to go for the fresh eating market, uh, they probably won't withstand or handle that mechanical harvesting very well. So we're looking at a hand harvest uh, and then storing in a specialized walk-in cooler that has really high humidity and cool temperatures. So uh, some differences as we build out our farms and as our agricultural enterprises based on what we can use the berries for, their potential markets, and then also how we need to treat them in order to get them to that potential market. Give a quick plug here for grapes, uh, cold hardy grapes. I know these aren't berries, but uh, um, just uh, some other interesting work that's kind of going on. Uh, alongside of these cold hardy grapes uh, or the cold hardy berries or the cold hardy grapes. So these aren't uh, the varieties that we're used to seeing on the store shelf, like a Merlot or a Cabernet. Uh, these have been hybridized varieties with a, a native grape species here uh, in North America to create a really uh, cold hardy grape that can get way down in temperature, uh, can grow in these colder climates. Uh, uh, Minnesota and North Dakota are really leading development in cultivars for some of these. A whole bunch of different varieties here. A lot of names that we're not necessarily familiar with uh, uh, as uh, table grapes and wine grapes, but uh, definitely things that hopefully will pop up over time as these uh, small winery industries in these cold states gets up and running. So, uh, a couple things just quickly about grapes. Uh, definitely they're pretty labor intensive. Uh, so. One of my friends who owns a vineyard says, gosh, you need to touch each plant three times a year at least. Uh, you need to prune, you need to train the vine as it's growing, and then you need to harvest. Uh, they come into production in a couple of years. And if we get extremely cold winters, that vine can freeze all the way back down to the ground. 
but uh, it will re-sprout true, re -sprout true to cultivar because it's not a grafted uh, species. It's, uh, it, it's true, to, uh, true to its rootstock. Uh, and they need about 2000 degree growing days to reach uh, that potential sugar uh, bricks measurement. So uh, some places like Western Montana, we're kind of right on the edge of it and we flirt with it from year to year. Other places that get a little more growing degree units, uh, they have a little more success bringing those to full uh, uh, ripening and maturity. <clears throat> a couple of just uh, quick general generalist things for us to think about uh, all across the berry spectrum. Uh, powdery mildew definitely pops up from time to time. That can be changed with uh, uh, you know, that watering regime, if we're particularly if we're doing overhead watering uh, and then, you know, some pruning or some fungicide treatment, if we really are trying to get a hold of it because we have a horrible powdery mildew problem, don't really face it because again, we have dry, arid air. Uh, leaf spot, usually just cosmetic, don't, uh, don't deal with it too much, but sanitation goes a long way with that. And uh, soft light larvae can pop up and do foliar damage and feed. We can leave them alone as they're just doing foliar damage or we can do some insecticidal treatment to try to get a hold of them. And typically aphids also don't do a whole lot of treatment for. Pests that we do wrestle with, definitely. Uh, meadow voles can be a problem. They'll go into those berry orchards and they'll do some uh, girdling of stems and chew off the bark over the course of the winter. So uh, habitat or cover management to really reduce the amount of cover they have so they feel overly exposed and don't wanna go in that area can be an important uh, management strategy for meadow voles if they move into that space. Uh, trapping them out, uh, bait stations work, uh, and not as practical, but uh, trying to put exclusions of like a, a hardware cloth or a woven wire around the base to keep them out could be a possibility that's not as practical uh, as other solutions, just based on the nature of berries. Uh, weeds, going to be a perennial problem, definitely, particularly if you have perennial weeds. So do a lot of work identifying those species that you're wrestling with and then match that management tool for that weed with the species that you've identified. Uh, and really emphasis on a really strong management program before planting out berry plants really helps greatly benefit that orchard uh, to get it under control before you plant out in that. Uh, and then last, Birds, definitely uh, a challenge that uh, we need to, to net or exclude uh, or deter from getting to our berries and taking up our crop. So last little bit here, just some ideas to think about establishing your, uh, your berry orchard. I know I'm uh, running right up here towards one o'clock, so I'm going to move through this kind of quickly and hopefully get to a couple questions. Uh, first off, think a little bit about uh, where you're setting up your berry orchard at. Uh, think about that aspect, the direction it's gonna face, the amount of sun exposure it gets, if there's any prevailing winds that uh, uh, can cause some challenges or some opportunities for you. Uh, particularly look for cold air drainage and cold air pockets. Uh, think about locating that space out of where that coldest air is going to drain down and pool into. Uh, if it drains away from that space, great. If it's a place where it's a pocket where it's going to collect that cold air, uh, then that can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, also, fencing is pretty important uh, to keep deer away uh, and also elk or bear, even if that's something that you face in your area. Uh, for deer, eight foot tall fence is what's recommended. There's several different materials and uh, cost considerations and ideas. If you're in a small farm or a backyard environment, then definitely uh, so that visual impact and kind of the, the welcoming nature, both for your neighbors uh, and those good relationships across the fence. Uh, and for if you're doing a, a you pick operation or a small farm with a farm stand, uh, thinking about the just the visual impact of that fence is going to be something that will be important. Uh, layer on top of that is if you're uh, intending to go for an organic production option, then uh, there's some pretty limited treatment options. Uh, well, there's, I, I believe, no treatment options for wood available in an organic setting. Uh, so you might have to find some materials that are suitable for building that fence that meet organic guidelines. Uh, definitely talk to your uh, local uh, uh, state agriculture organic specialist about uh, what some of those guidelines are for building up that fence if you intend to do an organic system. Uh, different types of fence, different types of uh, expenses for sure. Um, the uh, <clears throat> woven wire fences are, are pretty impenetrable once uh, 
They, um, you, you get them up, they don't take as much maintenance, but they're more expensive. Uh, electric fence and electric wire is a possibility. Uh, it's cheaper, but takes more management to definitely keep it from grounding out uh, and uh, works pretty good, but uh, sometimes deer can find their way through that, particularly if they're being pressured by predators or they're feeling threatened. Uh, or could be a hybrid, a combination of maybe some mesh and some wire or some hot wire. So definitely uh, 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 different possibilities. So uh, big thing to think about is uh, to think about managing the vegetation that's there before you plant out your orchard. So uh, uh, identification of the perennial species that you're gonna wrestle with in that space and manage them before you plant out your berry orchard, pretty important. So uh, could be a perennial species like uh, quackgrass or Canada thistle, particularly those rhizominous spreading weeds, uh, definitely spend some time matching up control tools for those so that you can get a handle on those and get them out of there. Um, you might consider a pre-planting pre burn down with a herbicide, like a non-selective herbicide uh, like glyphosate, uh, in order to really clean up those rows, get rid of those rhizominous spreading plants, uh, and uh, create a good environment where for the first couple of years, those berry bushes are going to grow in an environment where they're not facing com competition from weeds and other grasses. Uh, reducing that competition for the first couple of years for berry plants will increase the success of those berry plants throughout the whole rest of their life. So uh, really spending the time beforehand to manage what we think is going to become a competitive weed or grass problem uh, helps out those berry plants quite a bit. Uh, possibility for mulching berry rows with woody debris, that's a great home for voles. So uh, it's a possibility, but uh, um, just be a little bit careful with that as is uh, um, using a plastic mulch. It's another great opportunity. Again, can be a home for voles. Uh, also just think what was the previous use of the field and is there any herbicide residual that I would, you would wrestle with? Uh, and then some practicalities, uh, like what are you gonna do with the uh, in-between row uh, parts of your, your orchard? Uh, are you gonna mow it? Uh, are you gonna irrigate it uh, or, or not and let it go dry? Uh, and are the species that you're gonna have there suitable for that kind of management? Uh, if you had an irrigated pasture and then you stop irrigating it and convert it into a berry patch that's on a drip system and you're never watering those grasses that used to be irrigated pasture grasses, uh, those plants are gonna die out over time uh, and something will move into that space. So it could be cheatgrass, it could be annual weeds or other things. So uh, just considering all of that as you get going, this is a great picture of planting some crimson clover or something that looks like in between those rows, which is great. Voles love clovers and legumes. So you could be creating a habitat that would then cause more problem for your berry patch over time. Uh, and then quickly just think about your row spacing. Uh, think about the size of your plants. Think about uh, what kind of equipment you want to use in between those rows, uh, where your water is at, and if you're going to use any kind of a mechanical harvester, do you have turnaround space at the end of those rows suitable for using that equipment inside of your fencing? Uh, and then super quick plug, join your state association for uh, growers of berries. So Montana is forming a Montana Berry Growers Association. Here they are, they're montanaberries.org. Join them, uh, you know, great organization and lots of different states have some kind of an organization that is promoting uh, the, the growth and production uh, and market growth of small fruit and berries. 